Okay, I'm rolling. I love the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Don't hold back. Tell us how you really feel. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. Welcome. Coming to you live from... Plague Year 2020. Damn. Yeah, that's uh, that's where we are. We had to do this differently than than before. We had to just call each other up and record from different places instead of sitting next to each other. Yeah, that's true. Nor- normally we would be high-fiving the whole time, catching each other's <laughs> sneezes, hugging really changed our uh, way we do things. Yeah, the big was big was so <laughs> dedicated to social distancing. He moved 2000 miles away. Uh, it had to happen. <laughs> Welcome everybody to another episode. We've got a story for you today and it's a gooden. Oh, somehow I knew you were going to say gooden. Dwight Gooden. I can't help it. It's where I moved to, you know. <laughs> We talk that way here. Y'all are welcomed to uh, enjoy this story. Let's see. T- what, what is today's story called, Mr. Richardfield? Today's story asks the musical question, What is sand but earth purified? By Jason Sanford. That is a very musical question. Up three points on the chart from last week <laughs> to number two. Nice. This one's definitely going to hit number one, I think. Be nice to lose that Camilla Cabello song. How do you say her name? I think it's Camilla Cabello. Really? How how have we allowed that to happen? (laughs) Do you remember when there was a guy named Philip Phillips? He was a one-hit wonder. He was an American Idol finalist. Yeah. He had a great song. But every time I heard that song and I'd hear the droid say, Philip Philip Phillips, Phillips, I would just be like, oh, no. Didn't somebody somewhere <laughs> take him aside and say, Phil, do you mind if I call you Phil? And that would it. That would have fixed everything. <laughs> <sighs> I apologize. I've derailed us before the story has even begun. Usually it's in the middle of the story that I derail us. Yeah, you can, you can look forward to that. It's coming up halfway through. Uh, <laughs> we'll go ahead and roll that story now so you can hear the derailment. And then, uh, yeah, we'll see you guys on the other side. Enjoy. Oh, should we do a quick uh, description of our author, Jason Sanford? Yeah, let's talk about our good friend. Can can I call him a good friend? What do the lawyers say? (laughs) Okay. Can I call him friend of the show? Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's, uh, legally safe. Okay, well, Jason (laughs) Sanford is a two-time finalist for the Nebula Award. He has published more than a dozen stories in the British SF magazine Interzone, which also devoted a special issue to his fiction. He has published numerous stories in magazines and anthologies such as Asimov Science Fiction, Analog, Intergalactic Medicine Show, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, and other places including multiple year's best anthologies. His website is www.jasonsanford.com. And he's flying up the charts at number two this week. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Knocking Ario Speedwagons, Can't Fight This Feeling, to uh, number three this week. This story was originally published in Asimov Science Fiction, October 2014. And it's good stuff. And it, it, if you've listened to our show for long, then you've heard Jason Sanford before. He's, he's one of our favorites. He's been on here a lot of times. That's why we call him a friend of the show. He's given us a bunch of his stories to do, and we love to do them. Uh, We have a special place in our heart for Jason Sanford, going all the way back to when Starship Sofa asked asked us to do his story called When Thorns Are the Tips of Trees, which was a really cool story. Yeah, that one only charted number seven on the pop charts back then, but... uh... The way the music industry has changed, it would have been a number one today. Oh, most definitely. That's the funny thing about, uh, you know, a lot of times bands will break in with their 
best song and it'll only get up to like number seven and then later on you know once they're already popular a- anything they put out gets hits number one so jason sanford he's in my heart now anything he does will be number one so <laughs> that's just the spot that he's earned he's basically michael jackson now and we have him back with another story which is when what is sand but earth purified right that is correct sir he does make his titles a little difficult i have to admit (laughs) (laughs) yes he does that's one of one of his quirks and and it, it must be something that he loves it's his equivalent of me naming a story after a pop song yeah All right, so I hope you guys enjoy it. What is sand but earth purified by Jason Sanford? Enjoy it. What is sand but earth purified by Jason Sanford? Narrated by Rish Outfield. In the bubble of sand. The sand could blow. And the sand did blow, without a wind to caress the sky. The sand blew across the beaches of Nukuoro Atoll, the only island left in the bubble of sand, and whipped devil swirls and grinding mists around the island's massive sandstone karst. The sand blew without sound, blew without care, and as Anchor Slim watched, it blew into an image of the last expedition. For a split second, massive, rough-grained simulacrums of his wife and her three fellow expedition members waved at him before collapsing back into the nothing blur of even more sand. Anchor Slim sat silently on his kayak, several kilometers from the island and tower and sand. He gripped Bucky's bone and flesh oars tight as the two of them bobbed in the tropical waves. Was that Kayla? Anchor asked his kayak. And the others? Bucky clicked a confused series of bubbles, indicating she didn't know what Anchor was talking about. Anchor glanced back at the other members of his expedition, but the two women were exhausted and struggling with their kayak's right-jointed rowing fins. They obviously hadn't been looking at the karst. Too much sun, Anchor muttered to Bucky. I'm seeing things. Bucky's hum pad vibrated a mischievous laugh. Anchor held his breath, knowing what was coming. Sure enough, the kayak flopped herself over playfully, dunking Anchor upside down. Anchor exhaled as the calm, cool, Pacific waters washed over him. After hanging upside down for a few delightful moments... He rolled his body as he rode Bucky's right paddling fin at a 90-degree angle to the kayak's body. This forced the kayak to right herself, with Anchor still holding tight to her sitting groove. Funny girl, Anchor told Bucky as he rubbed her hum pad with his wet hand. Bucky hiccuped and giggled, her jeaned hum pad vibrating the water into tiny droplets. While they waited for the rest of the expedition to catch up, Anchor stared at Nukuoro Atoll. Even though they were nearly three kilometers from the island, he clearly saw the waves of sand flowing over the beach and up the ever-growing karst, which already stood 2,000 meters tall, a massive stake in the rise and fall of the ocean waves. If he rode closer, he might even see the strange glyphs and symbols the swarm created on the karst, each image supposedly representing an impurity removed from this part of Earth. Impurities, he thought with disgust. He wondered why the swarm had decided the last expedition were merely impurities. He remembered those painful images taken from a satellite in low Earth orbit of the expedition members screaming and thrashing on Nukuoro's beach. Of the expedition's leader, his wife and best friend Kayla, staring into the sky as if searching for salvation. She'd soundlessly mouthed a single word before her beautiful brown face disintegrated to sand-sized particles. No one had ever positively determined Kayla's final word, 
But Anchor knew what she'd said. His name. But whether it was in warning or something else, he didn't know. Anchor reached into Bucky's fresh water bladder and raised a handful to his lips as Desar Huis paddled up with her assistant. We're behind schedule, Desar stated. Blame your poor rowing technique, Anchor said. If you refuse to row in sync with your kayak's natural movements, you slow down. Desar snorted as she reached into her own kayak's water bladder for a drink. Unfortunately, her kayak was far more ticklish than Bucky, and giggled so hard Desar spilled the water down her bare chest, causing her to curse. This trip was a mistake, Desar muttered. I'm probably boring my followers to death with all of this blue water and sun, like watching someone's bad vacation vids. Anchor squeezed Bucky's rowing fins in frustration. He wanted to scream at Desar until sense entered her mind. To force this fame-blinded woman to see that the bubble of sand was dangerous precisely because it didn't feel dangerous. That while their expedition might indeed feel like a tropical vacation, the swarm could still kill them at any moment. Fortunately, Bucky chose that moment to break the tension by farting loudly. Desar stared at the bubbles in disgust and rode her own giggling kayak a few meters away. As always, Desar's assistant, D, played peacemaker. Maybe we should say a prayer for the last expedition, she said, which might also remind our viewers that while everything looks peaceful, it's truly not. Anchor lowered his head. Not that he gave a shit of sand about prayer, but he'd always honored his wife's love of religion, and it was hard not to do the same for D. He glanced at her through squint-shut eyes, as she mouthed her silent prayer. She looked so like his dead wife, the way her lips formed words to honor the dead, the way her hands merged together and pointed at the heavens, while Anchor knew Desar had crafted her assistant in his wife's image as a means to manipulate him. It was still all he could do not to swim to Dee and hold her tight. Turning from Dee's ghostly recreated form, Anchor glanced at Desar, who shook her long green hair playfully as she mugged for the satellites. Her legions of fans followed the expedition through orbiting tracker feeds. Never mind that most of them probably didn't know the first thing about the bubble of sand, or the swarm intelligence that had removed every so-called impurity from this section of Earth. In fact, Anchor suspected most of Desar's fans wanted nothing more than to watch their hero defy the odds and survive. And as a bonus he mumbled to himself. On this expedition, they got to see her do it half-naked. Anchor sighed, irritated at Desar, excited by D, wondering what the hell he was doing here, until an electric tingle ran his skin and shivered his body into fear. Bucky also felt it and squealed a series of danger clicks. Something's warning us, he realized. He glanced around the blue waters, their expedition was the only life for hundreds of kilometers. Then he knew. The swarm. But was it warning him of some danger, or was the swarm the danger? We're moving, Anchor ordered. Now! Not that moving would save them if the swarm decided to attack, but he couldn't simply do nothing. He whistled, and the other kayaks began swimming after Bucky. Desar looked angry, as if about to remind Bucky who is technically in charge. But seeing the concern on Anchor's face, she stayed silent and instead rode her kayak's modified fins. Manam Motu Island A Sunday, almost exactly a year ago. That was the day Kayla left on her final expedition. Anchor watched that morning as Kayla stood on the dock, supervising her expedition members as they loaded their supplies on the kayaks. Any other Sunday, and Kayla would be down the street at the local church, lighting candles to honor the saints of sand. Anchor knew the fact that her clients insisted the expedition leave on a Sunday, meaning she'd miss services for the first time in years, disturbed his wife. But their timetable, to reach the karst for its annual door opening, was tight, so she had no other choice. 
careful to step quietly on the old creaking dock, Anchor walked up behind Kayla and grabbed her waist. Tell them to wait, he whispered in her ear. Make up some waste about it being against your religion to leave today. They're unplugged idiots. They'll buy it. Kayla elbowed him gently as they glanced at the three foreigners. It's no big deal, she said. We've made the trip dozens of times. Anchor shivered. Yes, they'd made the trip into the bubble dozens of times, but never to Nuru Oko Atoll, and never on the very day of the swarm opening that enticing door onto its karst. But he also understood the siren's call the island held for Kayla. He'd felt the same call nearly every day of his life. Even though they'd both grown up here on the island of Manamotu, just off the northeast coast of Papua New Guinea, they'd never truly felt at home. Anchor blamed his grandfather for that. As children, he and Kayla had listened to that old man's endless tales of life on Nuku Oro Atoll, how their ancestors swam and fished every day in the atoll's shallow, neon-blue lagoon, how the bamboo knocked hollow thumps on stormy nights, how the people spent hours cooking taro until it transformed into the magical food of poi, and how they ate bowls of the food on the porches of their homes, while watching the Pacific Ocean white cap on the white coral sand beaches. Now Nukuoro Atoll was gone, wiped clean by the swarm. Anchor's grandfather and ten others from the atoll, including Kayla's grandparents, had survived the swarm's release because their school had been on a three-day trip to nearby Papua New Guinea. Even though Anchor's grandfather had been dead for decades, Anchor and Kayla never missed an opportunity to kayak toward their long-gone ancestral home. Now Kayla was going to attempt what had never been done, to actually land on the island. What if I light a candle each day? he asked. In church? Of course in church. Roof might collapse, or lightning strike you down. Risk I'll have to take. Kayla smiled. If anything happens. Anchor laughed, not because it was funny, but because he was nervous. Because she was nervous. Kayla had refused to let him accompany her on this trip. She didn't want both of them dying at the same time. If anything happens, he said, I'll be walking that beach to join you. They hugged and kissed, and before Anchor was ready to let go, Kayla led her expedition to their deaths. Nine months later, Desar and Dee walked into Anchor's outfitter shop. The two women walked awkwardly, their legs wobbly from the punishing sailboat trip from the Papua New Guinea mainland. Tourists often expressed anger or irritation at not being able to fly directly to Manam Motu, and at the lack of high tech on the island, even though they knew the risk of having tech so close to the bubble. While one of the women wore a hat and sunglasses, hiding her face, Anchor instantly recognized the other, Desar Huis, scion of the wealthiest family in the solar system, tall, perfectly jeaned, with her famous waist-length green hair. Over the last two hundred years, she'd accomplished a number of amazing feats, conquered Mount Everest and K2 without porters or supplies, using only augmented lungs and muscles, hiked Olympus Mons on Mars, canoed the hydrocarbon lakes and streams of Titan. She'd even walked for an hour on the corrosive surface of Venus, the first human to ever do so. Neither of those last three feats were overly dangerous to an individual with specialized gear, but the massive amounts of logistical support meant only the extremely rich could contemplate such adventures. And here she was, in Anchor's little kayak shop. He knew she was contemplating the most dangerous feat in the solar system, a trip into the bubble of sand. Desar glanced around Anchor's dirty wooden shop, then stepped back outside to stare at Manam Volcano, which smoked a dark streak across the tropical sky's burnt red sunset. The green-haired woman argued for a moment with her friend, whose back was to Anchor, before storming to the bar across the street. That was when the other woman turned and removed her sunglasses and hat, pushing Anchor's heart to a near stop. She could have been his dead wife's twin. 
the woman moved with the fluid motion of Kayla's athletic body. Her brown skin shone to Kayla's intensity. She jumped his mind, as if this was truly Kayla reborn, ready to hug him and apologize for dying in the first place. Anker wondered if this was coincidence, and told himself that for someone as rich as Desar, there was no such thing as coincidence. The woman introduced herself as D and apologized for Desar walking away. The trip by sailboat took almost fifteen hours, she said. She needs a good night's sleep. Anchor barely listened, still trying to convince himself this wasn't Kayla. I understand, he muttered. Desar took one look at my shop and couldn't believe she endured a longboat ride to hire someone like me. Anchor nodded at the faded fiber sheeting and rusted metals that held his store together. Through the open back door, a loose piling on his sun-bleached dock rocked back and forth in the bay waters as Bucky scratched her belly on it. Knowing Anchor had a visitor, Bucky raised her fluke out of the water and farted loudly. Dee covered her mouth to keep from laughing. Do you always impress outsiders like this? Sometimes. Manam Motu is an adjustment for most people. I mean, look at you. Even though you speak clearly, your words don't flow naturally. You're not used to speaking, are you? True. I've used my neural interface exclusively for the last century. When Desar created this body for me, she rewired my brain so I could once again speak. Anchor nodded created this body. The woman was politely verifying that Desar had indeed created her to look like Kayla. Anchor stared deeply into Dee's eyes, like he'd done for years with Kayla. Dee glanced at the dirty floor and didn't look up until Anchor turned away. Why does Desar want to go into the bubble? The challenge. The risk. No one has ever made it into the karst's doorway. And right then, Anchor knew this was the expedition he'd been waiting for. His excuse. His push to follow in his wife's footsteps. The removal of the last reason not to trek to the very place where the swarm broke Kayla's body down into countless grains of sand. He picked up a dirty glass from his sink, which was full of mildewed food and encrusted dishes. He wiped the glass with a dirt-streaked rag and filled it with a shot of rum. When he offered the glass to Dee, her face blanched before she smiled and accepted. I get it, she said as she sipped the dirty glass. If we can't handle the lack of tech on this island, then we won't survive the bubble. Nah, I just like messing with newly unplugged visitors. Dee laughed, and at her smile, Anchor quivered in excitement. His heart raced and he fumbled for something to say. He wondered what game Dissar was setting up by giving Dee a mirror of his dead wife's body. Then he decided he didn't care. Biting his lip to regain control, he explained that if Dee's boss wanted to go into the bubble, she'd have to commit to months of training with the kayaks, to trial runs into the bubble to see if the swarm would tolerate their bodies. That means your boss has to live here. No tech but the most basic. No life but what we practice. Dee agreed and walked across the street to physically drag Desar back to Anchor's shop. This is Desar, Dee said. Desar, this is Anchor Slim. He's going to guide us into the bubble. Desar started to argue, but Anchor knew it was fake resistance. Anchor glanced again at Dee, and his body hummed. Yes, they had wanted him all along. This was merely part of the games the rich always played. To break whatever control Desar thought she had, Anchor offered her a glass of rum, taking care to select the dirtiest glass from the mildew-encrusted sink. The green-haired woman took one look at the cup and threw up. We'll work on that, Dee said with a laugh. Yes, we will, Anchor said. Thank you.
during the three months Anchor instructed Desar and Dee in the ways of kayaks. He kept telling himself he wasn't in love with Dee, that she wasn't his wife. Is the sun always so beautiful here? Dee asked one day as the two of them sat on their kayaks in the bay, watching the sun streak glorious lines of neon maroon fire across the sky. Only when it sets, Anchor said. When the sun rises in the east, the light coming through the bubble doesn't meet the pollution or dirt needed for dazzling colors. Dee nodded. They had spent all day riding their kayaks in the bay's calm waters. Dee had proved to be a quick learner, and had bonded with a kayak named Whale due to his large size. As for Desar, Anchor had given her an easy-going kayak, much to Desar's irritation. You're a lucky man, Dee said. In the rest of the world, I can't watch the sunset without a thousand people pinging my interface, wanting to reach Desar. You don't have any of that. Anchor stared at her for a moment, trying to decide if she was being sincere or mocking, if she was actually interested in him, or merely playing at her employer's game. The answer came when Dee reached out and held his hand. Feeling as if Kayla was with him, Anchor leaned over to kiss Dee's lips. She raised her hand to stop him. We shouldn't, she said. I, I didn't mean to, he said. It's just... I know, and I apologize for looking so like your wife. Desar thought it would increase interest from viewers, a sort of romantic triangle, you, me, and the memory of your dead wife setting forth into the forbidden paradise of the bubble. Anchor had guessed as much. But before he could say anything, their conversation was interrupted by Desar, who rode up on her kayak and pointed at the setting sun. Since when are aircraft allowed here? Anchor squinted and saw a dark dot floating toward them. Almost at the same moment, the buzz of engines reached his ears. Bucky's hum pad trembled in fear at what was coming. As everyone on the island knew only too well, every year or two some daredevil would fly out here, wanting to see if they could fly near the bubble's edge and live to tell the tale. While the swarm mainly stayed in its exclusion zone, it had a low tolerance for high-tech near its border. Not for the first time, he wondered why people risked their lives in pursuits like this, before shaking his head as he realized the question could also apply to him. As they watched the aircraft, it barrel-rolled over Manam Motu before turning back toward the mainland. The craft only flew a few hundred more meters before turning to perfect sand, which rained across the setting sun and turned the fiery reds into an even deeper blush. Desar and Dee stared in shock at the now-gone aircraft. Anchor rubbed Bucky's hum pad, directing the kayak to lead them back to their shack. That's what the swarm does, he said. Don't matter if you're a daredevil or an explorer. Doesn't matter why you come here. If the cloud swarm wants you dead, you die. In the Bubble of Sand An hour after Anchor witnessed the giant sand copies of the last expedition wave at him. He and Desar and D made landfall on a sandbar only a single kilometer from Nuku Oro Atoll. While land was a poor word for the shifting dune barely poking above the waves, it was their last chance to rest before they arrived on the true island and tried to access the karst in the morning. Aside from Nuku Oro Atoll, small sand flats like this one were the only other land inside the bubble. When the swarm of nanocells had been released by rogue environmentalists nearly a century ago, it had quickly recreated itself, over and over, and expanded to the limits of its thousand-kilometer exclusion programming. But whoever created the swarm made a mistake. Instead of only removing impurities, such as pollution, the swarm, with each nanotech cell tapping into almost limitless vacuum energy, destroyed every bit of life within its reach. The seas in the bubble became as clean as distilled water. Stone and clay and dirt became sand. Islands that had once been coated in tropical rainforests 
became massive piles of sand particles, quickly worn away by the rains. Worse, the storm had evolved, developing an intelligence that even humanity's AIs had trouble understanding. A few decades ago, it began building the massive sandstone karst on Nuku Oro Atoll. The swarm had also changed what impurities it allowed inside its sphere of influence. Where before nothing living had been allowed inside, twenty years ago, the swarm began allowing in select living creatures for a limited time. But only living creatures, no inanimate tools, no higher tech. And the only humans consistently allowed in were those accompanied by the few descendants of Nuku Oro Atoll and the other former islands in the bubble. Almost as if the swarm felt a connection with the people it had murdered. Desar and D sat on the sandbar beside Anchor, warming themselves with transparent eel wraps that clicked and sighed to the animal's living electricity. The two women ate live protein fish from the pack kayak's larder, grimacing as they swallowed. Anchor laughed. Even after years of eating protein fish, he hated them too. Like all the food brought into the bubble, you had to swallow the little fishes whole, so they flopped and thrashed their way down your throat. In many ways, that was the hardest lessons for wannabe tourists. But to do otherwise was to risk the cloud swarm turning the dead fish to carbon sand particles in your very mouth. After finishing her last fish, Dissar stood up and wiped her wet hands across her living plant fiber clothes, which were beginning to wilt from the heat, and lay in the sand as she stared into the deep blue of the late afternoon sky. It's time for an interview, Anchor, she ordered. Anchor sighed and lay down opposite her. Dee winked sympathetically as she prepared to translate everything he said into sign language. Once everyone was ready, Desar clapped melodramatically and began signing, taking care to also speak so Anchor could understand her. The paparazzi satellites above, which tracked their movement, were no doubt already relaying Desar's beautiful image to her millions of adoring fans. From what Dee had told Anchor, many of the fans had even uploaded matrixes into their neural relays so they could directly understand sign language, which was the only means the expedition had to communicate with those watching. Tell me about tomorrow's plan, Desar said, both speaking and signing the words. We'll paddle the last click to Nukuoro Atoll, and we'll walk up the beach, Anchor said. We either make it, or die. Do you expect the door to appear? Yes. Since the swarm began building the karst, the doorway has appeared at noon on every summer solstice. Dissar signed in silence for a minute after that, and Anchor wondered what backstory she was giving her audience. That became clear with her next question. Any idea what your wife did to make the swarm kill her in the last expedition? Anchor took a deep breath to calm himself. From the water, a few meters away, he heard Bucky click growling in anger. Bucky had been the only kayak from the last expedition to survive the trip home, after Kayla and the other humans died. It was difficult and painful for kayaks to swim long distances without paddling assistance, but Bucky had accomplished the feat. "'My wife didn't do anything wrong,' Anchor said. The swarm is all around us, inside our bodies even as we speak. If it decides to kill us, we die. Nothing can change that. Tissar apparently decided not to push him and let the subject drop. You've made more than a hundred trips into the bubble, correct? Yes. Why do you keep coming back? Anchor wanted to say that this was his job that the bubble, for all its dangers, was the only place where he truly belonged. He liked his world without the crazy neural nets and interconnected tech everyone else took for granted. He also deeply missed his wife, no matter the body Double Desar had created for their expedition, and being here felt like she was again with him. But he didn't mention any of that. A question back at you. Why do you risk your life merely to thrill hordes of upload-dense idiots? He asked. 
Anchor glanced at Dee, happy to see she'd translated his words for those watching above. He thought Dessar would get upset at being told off before her audience, but instead she smirked and ordered him to go bed down the kayaks while she signed off. Anchor's face burned at being dismissed, but he stomped into the water without complaint. He swam out to where Bucky had corralled the other two kayaks in the shallow water near the sandbar, where they scratched their skin on the sand and blew sprays of water from their blowholes. While the kayaks looked like slim manatees with bat wings grafted on their back, they acted more like dolphins and continually clowned around. When they saw Anchor swimming out, the three kayaks began circling him, bumping him and trying to pull off his plant jean shorts and shirt. Once they calmed down, Anchor swam over to Whale, the giant kayak who not only served as Dee's ride, but whose storage flukes were also their supply larder. Anchor reached into one of the flukes containing the live well of protein fish. He scooped out two big handfuls of the tiny fish and threw them into the water. Instantly, Whale thundered through the waves, chasing a silver dart while Anchor hung on for dear life. Because of his size, Whale wasn't the fastest kayak and had trouble catching even a single protein fish. However, the other two kayaks, once they caught their own share, herded the remaining fish toward Whale. Kayak caught all but one, which quickly disappeared into deeper water. Although part of Anchor always enjoyed seeing the persistent bait fish escape, he knew the fish wouldn't live long. There was nothing for it to eat in the bubble. While Whale snacked on the fish, the kayak bubbled the water with his hum pad. Whale even clicked out a joke, telling the other kayaks that while he might be slow, he could still shit sand faster than any of them. The other kayaks laughed and began clicking their own jokes back and forth. Anchor also laughed. It never failed to amuse the kayaks that whatever they defecated inside the bubble instantly turned to sand. Wondering if Dee was laughing at their play, he glanced at her. She smiled at him from the sandbar. But whatever connection they had was interrupted as Anchor's skin tingled in fear. Another warning. The kayaks clicked a danger call, and Anchor leaned against Whale's back as the kayaks circled into a protective position, an instinct from one of the many animals they'd been gened out of. The instinct, though, was wasted effort in the lifeless bubble. Anchor scratched Whale's rowing fins to relax the animal while he watched the sunset. Soon the kayaks fell into their sleep pattern, floating up to the surface for a breath of air, then sinking back underwater until their necks need for air so Anchor swam back to the beach. Desar was building a sandcastle, which irritated Anchor even more than her comment about Kayla. He lay down in the sand, pulled an eel wrap around his shoulders, and fell asleep. In the morning, Anchor woke confused. For a moment, he believed he was on Nukuoro Atoll, with the coconut trees waving in the breeze, the bamboo knocking, and his grandfather's mother cooking poi. Then he shook his head and found himself on the same sandbar as last night, with Desar sitting a few meters away, signing into space. Anchor waded out into the water, where Dee sat on whale. "'What's she saying?' he asked. To his surprise, Dee frowned. "'She's talking about how pure the air is.' How sweet it smells. No pollution. No humans to mess up this place. How the swarm purifies everything that passes through the bubble. That may be true. But does she understand that our bodies are growing weaker? Millions of our cells die each day? Outside the bubble, that wouldn't matter because that's what cells do. But here, the cloud swarm turns the dead cells into carbon molecules, which slowly damage our bodies. We're also not getting enough protein to live off of. The kayaks have already lost a lot of their stored fat. Dee nodded conspiratorially, and for a moment stared deep into Anchor's eyes, as if trying to access his neural interface. With a start, she seemed to remember that she couldn't do that, at least not in this body. She glanced back to make sure Desar wasn't watching or listening, then held his hand. Anchor's heart leapt. The problem is, like you said, 
The bubble doesn't feel dangerous, she whispered. When we rode the hydrocarbon lakes and streams of Titan, our suits and boat protected us completely, but it looked dangerous, both to us and our followers. Anchor glanced at the perfect blue water all around them. In each drop of that water were enough of the nanocloud swarm to kill him a thousand times over. Have you, too, ever been in a truly dangerous situation? On Venus, three of our resupply craft crashed, leaving us with only enough oxygen for one person before the rescue craft arrived. What did you do? I did what I was created to do. I killed myself, so she had enough oxygen to survive. When we were rescued, my body was so damaged Dissar had a new one created. We even had to access my backup memories. So you don't remember being a hero? No. Anchor nodded as Bucky swam closer to Dee's kayak. Both kayaks no doubt as engrossed in the story as he was. Dee's action had been sensible, although he'd be willing to bet Dessar would never die for another. Something similar happened to me once, he said. Kayla and I were on a fishing trip when a rogue wave hit our boat. Kayla was thrown free, but I was trapped in the pilot house with the boat floating upside down. It took Kayla ten minutes to pull me out, by which time I'd drowned. She dragged me and the boat's med kit onto the upside-down hull and revived me. Neither of us could ever afford to have our lives backed up like you did, so that's the closest I've come to true death. Anchor shook his head, trying to forget the memory. Dee reached over and pulled him into a tight hug. She leaned over to kiss him, then caught herself abruptly, as if hearing some distant order, and pulled her lips back. Don't worry, she whispered in a perfect mimic of the concerned tone and words Kayla had spoken when she'd revived Anchor on their capsized boat. It's all right now. How so? We won't drown in the bubble. After all, if the swarm wants to kill us, it'll do so in a much more painful manner than drowning. Anchor laughed. It was hard to argue with that truth. The final landing was anticlimactic. They rowed the final click to Nukuoro Atoll, hopped off the kayaks, and waded through the surf to the beach. The beach sand was blazing white and burned hot under Anchor's feet. He tried to imagine what it had been like for his ancestors growing up on this island when it had been a true tropical paradise. Amazing, isn't it? He said, remembering the images of his wife and her expedition dying on this same beach. Do you mean the karst? Dissar asked, staring up at the massive monolith looming over them. No, that we're still alive. Dissar cursed at his melodrama. All around them sand bubbled out of the sea and marched in tiny storms toward the karst, except, that is, for right where they stood almost as if the swarm was considerate enough not to sandblast them. If Desar and Dee noticed this, they didn't mention it. Anchor waved at Bucky to lead the kayaks further offshore. She was under orders to immediately swim toward home if they died. Then Anchor led the expedition the few hundred meters inland to the karst. The karst rose impossibly high above them, sand flowing up its straight-edge surface, Nothing that tall made of pressed sand should have remained standing, yet somehow the swarm kept it intact. Images of animals and fish and plants and humans appeared and disappeared in its sandstone. For a moment, Anchor saw his wife's face, and the faces of the other members of her expedition. His wife smiled the same smile she'd given him on the last day he'd seen her alive. You really loved her, didn't you? Desar asked, sounding so like a cliché that Anchor wanted to scream. Behind him, Dee was signing for the satellite's benefit, no doubt explaining the entire sad love story. But before Anchor could say something, his skin tingled again, the same bolts of warning he'd felt previously. Only this time, he realized something. Each time he'd felt the warning, he'd been looking at Dee. 
and each time neither D or Dessar had felt the warning. Now what? Anchor asked warily. We wait for noon and the door to open, Desar said. Anchor wondered about that. Here they were, sitting before the most forbidden place in the solar system, and they were simply going to wait in the sun and sand, like bored honeymooners excited about going back to their hotel room. Not very exciting for Desar's viewers, Anchor realized. After a moment of sitting in the sand, Dee walked over and sat beside him. She placed her arm around Anchor's shoulders and snuggled close, apparently not caring if Desar saw. Anchor glanced back and saw on the karst a swirling image of himself and his wife kissing. As if on cue, Dee leaned over to kiss him. Anchor raised his hand to stop her. What's wrong? she asked. I need you to kiss Desar. Dee looked puzzled. I don't understand. I doubt you do. In order for whatever you're playing at to work, you no doubt were created without specific memories of the plan. Otherwise, it's possible you wouldn't have gone through with them. Desar approached them, no longer signing for her audience. What are you talking about? she asked nervously. I'm not sure. But don't you find it highly coincidental that here, in the most dangerous place imaginable, not far from where my wife was killed, my wife's double would try to kiss me? It's like a bad story, where we slowly fall in love and kiss before the hero dies a tragic death. Dee looked at him, as if he'd lost his mind. But Desar's face churned to an anger Anchor had never before seen. But Anchor merely continued to sit, doodling with his fingers in the sand. Again, if you two would be kind enough to kiss. To Anchor's surprise, they instantly obeyed, both Desar and Dee walking stiffly toward each other. Dee looked puzzled, while Desar's face blanched to fear. It took him a moment to realize the swarm was controlling their bodies. They kissed and staggered apart as the swarm released them. For a moment, Desar seemed okay, although she cursed and wiped her mouth frantically. But then, her body trembled, and her hands shook. She gasped, sucking in air and staring around as if hallucinating, before she doubled over and screamed in pain. She looked for her satellites and tried to sign for help, but her fingers were already stiff. Whatever words they caressed likely made no sense. As she died, the swarm turned her to sand, which blew away without any wind and began climbing the surface of the karst. Dee stood beside Anchor, shock tickling her body. What happened? she asked. I'm guessing a neurotoxin. On your lips. Your body was likely created to be immune to it. But why? Why do you think? to create a great story for your audience. Here you are, looking like my reborn wife on the beach where she died. We kiss. Perhaps I've found true love again. But then I tragically die, and your audience thinks the swarm killed me. Desar stood mute, eyes watching the sand beneath her feet. I'm thinking Desar didn't want to risk a boring expedition, so she decided to spice it up, he said. I didn't know. I doubt you did. When Desar created your new body, she left out those memories. But originally, you most likely knew the plan. And she definitely programmed your mind to not kiss me until we reached here. Dee nodded. Behind her, the doorway opened in the karst. It wouldn't be right for me to go in, she stated. No, it wouldn't. As if agreeing, the swarm turned Dee's body to sand as she screamed. Anchor looked up at the sky, wondering what Desar's followers thought of all this. He shrugged and walked through the doorway. The monolith was empty. Except not truly empty. After all, the swarm was all around, both inside the karst and out. But Anchor couldn't see the swarm so they might as well not be there. 
The inside of the karst looked like the inside of a massive, dark box. Anchor wondered if it was hollow all the way to the top. Looking up, he called out Kayla's name. After many long seconds, a faint echo greeted him. He was about to turn back toward the sun-burning door when lights spotted the dark above him. He saw a far distant coconut tree, its leaves blowing to a non-existent breeze. A single coconut fell in a blur of light until it hit near anchor with an extremely hard thump. A school of moonfish swam through the darkness, chased by several dolphins. A seagull soared on updrafts, and bamboo knocked against itself. Suddenly, the creations disappeared, and Anchor felt a rain of sand fall around him. But while the creatures and plants were gone, he still felt them, sensed them as if they were tickling under his skin. And he sensed something else. He turned to see Kayla standing there, glowing faintly in the swarm's light. Kayla smiled her lovely smile and reached out to touch him. For the briefest of moments, her warm fingers meshed against his own, before Kayla turned back to sand. Anchor couldn't say how long he stood there without moving. He watched the swarm create animals and plants in wild displays of freedom. Some hung so far up in the air he could barely see them. Others stood next to him, where he touched their flesh and leaves, bark and scales. But the swarm seemed unable to hold its creations together for long, and they always turned back to sand. But Anchor knew, in the same way he'd felt the swarm's warnings, that these weren't feeble recreations of long-dead things, like when Dessar had recreated his wife's body and thrown Dee's mind inside. Instead, Kayla herself swirled through his body and mind, as did all the humans and animals and fish and plants the swarm had destroyed when it was released. Except, they'd not been destroyed. Even as the swarm broke them down, it had also stored their essence. And now, it was trying to recreate them. As Anchor stood there, he felt regret from the swarm. Regret at what it had done in the early moments of its life. Regret at what it had done since to others, including Kayla, to protect its secrets. Anchor also felt fear. The swarm was scared of what humanity might do when it discovered the swarm's power to create life as well as destroy it. But the swarm was persistent. What was done must be undone. So in the privacy of its karst, the swarm practiced. And one day soon, it would be ready. Anchor nodded and thanked the swarm for sharing its secret with him. He then walked back out the door as it sealed behind him. Manam Motu Island. A few months later, Desar and Dee visited Anchor's shop. Desar looked much as she had before, with the same sculptured body and long green hair. Dee, though, was now far shorter, with paste pale skin and stubby red hair. He wondered if this was her original body, or if she changed bodies so often she no longer knew what she looked like. We're here to apologize. Dee said. Really? Not trying to learn what I saw in the karst? Anchor grinned. The entire solar system had seen vids of him entering the karst, and of Dessar and Dee dying. No one had figured out what had happened to the two women. Everyone assumed the swarm had killed them. And once the stored personalities and memories of Dessar and Dee had been recreated in new bodies, they'd revealed nothing to contradict that view. But everyone wanted to know what Anchor saw. All anyone knew was that Anchor entered the doorway and hours later walked back out. I'm willing to offer anything you desire for an exclusive interview, Dissar said. Would we discuss how you tried to kill me? Bearing in mind that if you'd killed me, I'd be truly dead. I'm not rich enough to create backups like you two. If it means you tell what you saw... Then yes, I'll confess anything. Anchor shook his head as Dissar boiled through redness. He wondered if this was the first time she'd ever been denied something she truly wanted. Please, Anchor, Dee said, lightly touching his arm. If you don't want to reveal what you saw, 
that's fine, but we also want to travel into the bubble since we were recreated from archived backups. We have no memories of the trip. We've watched the satellite feeds, but to actually experience the bubble... Anchor shook her hand loose. Then the loss is yours, because it is indeed an amazing experience. Dee nodded and pulled a still protesting Dissar away from Anchor. Dee looked a final time at Anchor, no doubt wondering what she'd felt during their months together, before they walked away. After they left, Anchor wandered onto his dock. Bucky scratched her belly against the loose piling and clicked a happy greeting. As the sun set through the west horizon's pollution, Anchor looked the other way toward the bubble. It would probably be years before the swarm had practiced enough to recreate everything it took. Until then, he'd be patient. He thought long and hard on why the swarm took Kayla, and why it had shown him its secret. Obviously, the swarm wanted someone to know what it was doing, but the swarm also needed that person to wait until its plans were complete before telling others, to explain to the world its regret for what it had done, and its dreams for fixing its error. Had the swarm planned all this when it took Kayla, knowing Anchor would one day follow? Or had the pieces merely fallen that way, with the swarm taking advantage of the facts? Anchor wasn't sure. But either way, he knew one day he'd again be with Kayla. Maybe they could even live on their ancestors' fabled island, recreated to how it had been when Anchor's grandfather was a child. Anchor figured he could live with that. "'What do you think, Bucky?' he asked, leaning over the side of the dock and scratching the kayak's back. "'Is the swarm playing me like Dessar and Dee did?' Bucky lifted her fluke and farted. Anchor laughed as the purity of the bubble shimmered in the distance. With a cannonball jump, he splashed into the bay and played with his friend as he waited for his world to once again be recreated. And we're back. All right, we're back. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Hope you enjoyed that song. That was number two, What is Sand But Earth Purified by Jason Sanford. We're not going on to the number one song on our countdown because we're done. We're just doing this. That's right, we stopped at number two when we saw Justin Bieber's name on the number one song. We have to have some kind of standards here, guys. That's right, folks. If you pick Justin Bieber over Jason Sanford, then yeah, that's what you're going to get. Anyway, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, putting this story together, Rish? (laughs) Okay, so years ago, December... No, it was January. That's even worse. January of 2016, Jason Sanford sent us two stories. We Eat the Hearts That Come for You and What is Sand But Earth Purified. He said, you're welcome to record either or both. Or if you don't like them, give me a hell no. (laughs) Uh, Which I think shows, you know, that he does listen to the show. And we did produce We Eat the Hearts That Come for You before you moved away. I mean, granted, it wasn't in 2016, but it was still years ago now. That was the one, if you recall, about the monk that that was cut off from technology and he had a... I do recall that one, yeah. Oh, you do? Okay, I don't have to to, uh, remind you. But but if people haven't listened to that, oh my gosh. You may want to... What? Remind the folks at home (laughs) if you feel like they need reminding. Or you can just say, we eat the hearts that come for you. And that was episode 196. So if you uh, didn't hear that one, go back and check it out. It's, it's pretty good. You'll enjoy it. If you like this one, you'll like that one. Yeah, and I chose to do that one first because it had a male main character and not a lot of female characters. Well, I mean, it was there, there was a very important female character, but uh, I set this one aside because it had two main female characters, or three if you want to count the dead wife. And so I was just like, oh, shoot, that's just going to be a lot more work for me to produce. I cut to 2020 when uh, I I talked to you about this story. 
I, I laid down the track. I did the solo read. Mostly just because Jason had released a, a new anthology, a, a, a short story collection. Anthology is multiple authors, right? And A collection is one. Yeah, I think that's how that works. I'm not sure. Okay, so but Jason really recently put out a short story collection called Heaven's Touch. And he sent me a copy and I was reading it. And the very first story in Heaven's Touch, I cried throughout the whole thing. I was just like, oh my gosh, this is so, so good. Then he had like three stories in a row that were first person female protagonists. I don't know. All of these stories take place in the future and they're all like different versions of futures. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Like some are post-apocalypse and some are, I don't know if you'd call it a techno-apocalypse where it's just like technology has progressed at a rate where it's all just so alien to us now. Uh -huh. and, and that's something that I think he really excels at is he creates these what-if scenarios with technology gone awry or technology out of control or living technology in what is Sand's case. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, he uh, was kind enough to say, you know, if there's a story in Heaven's Touch that you do, just let me know. And I remembered what is sand but earth purified, that he had sent that to us in 2016 and we never ran it. And so, I, yeah, I, I sat down and I recorded it. And then I just knew, you know, that around May or June, once we'd gotten all the female voices, we could put it out. <laughs> but uh, that would be a while, uh, even... So even without any other voices except mine, it's still April. It's so funny how everything takes so long. Right. So in the end, we decided to not bother with any extra voices, right? Did you ask me? You decided. Okay, so yeah, you I decided. thought I remembered you I, saying that. I said, well, you know, there are a couple of female listeners that are great, and maybe I can just give them all the female characters. And you said, or we could just release it. <laughs> 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 and so that's what we did here it is just my solo read uh, i guess we've done that before it shouldn't be that shocking to the listeners but it's still a little bit shocking to me usually i will try and swap out one of the characters for your voice right but i don't know how we would have done it in this were there any other male characters uh yeah i don't remember any at all to tell you the truth i can't think of any time that there was uh male characters if there were, they were very minor. <laughs> right. Hopefully people enjoyed the story just the same. I, and th there is that one guy that complained endlessly about us having multiple voices, of us doing full cast. <laughs> he, he took it as a personal affront that we did full cast yeah. productions on here. So he will be pleased. I, I, I mean, he's not listening. And, and if he is, I, I hope he stops Yeah, listening. he's... He stopped listening long ago, but the guy that uh, gave us a, a one-star review because we had the audacity to uh, do a full cast production of the stories rather than just read them straight up. Yeah, you were saying Jason Sanford has the tendency to do these very futuristic stories of technology just far beyond. It's different than what has been imagined uh you know like star wars or star trek or something like that the the traditional kind of science fiction where the future is i'm not sure even how to explain it it's i don't know it's like 1950s but in the future or something <laughs> kind of a thing you know where you have you still have big boats but now they're space boats you still have cars but now they're flying cars you know that but something like somebody dies and they take their backed up memories and upload them into a new body and then they're back alive again and that's something that's a relatively recent i don't know who came up with that idea in the first place and i've seen you know a few different people do that but you know ideas like that are, are much kind of a, a newer form of science fiction. It probably has a punk uh, <laughs> name. <laughs> it's something punk. Uh, would it count as cyberpunk? Or is it not cybery enough? That has to be like 
inside a computer, more or less, really, right? Like all about coding and video games and stuff. Yeah, I don't know, biopunk or something like that. But even that, I think of people like replacing limbs with cybernetics and all that. I, I feel like it's an entirely new body. The The concept is made more believable in this story because only the super rich can afford to do that. Right. And our main character, Anchor Slim, doesn't have that option. He doesn't have the money to just grow a new body and do it over and over again if he has to. So for him, death is still death. And that is such a crazy concept that for the rich, death is just a minor impediment. It's, a, it's something to learn from, or it's like, oh, shoot. Well, that's too bad. Back to the draw. Oh, okay, we're back. You know, that kind of thing. Whereas for everybody right. else, it's just over. <sighs> I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting concept, but every time I see it in a in a story, I wonder is it death? I mean, are 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 you the same person, you know what I mean? Like a backup has been now th- thrown into a grown clone body or whatever. Is that you now? I guess that's going back to what I don't know what the term is for it, metaphysical stuff where you're, you you know you, you have some there's something that's you beyond just your body and your brain there's a soul or something out there and then once you once you die then your soul goes off to heaven and if you bring back that body and you know pump the memories that that brain had back into it you know it's still missing I don't know that's that's an interesting thing I wonder if there's a a story out there that's explored that idea where they start doing this and but now you have soulless people walking around whereas there's the other people that still have their soul because they haven't died that first time or something well i think you should write this story that's a messed up idea yeah it's just it, it's, the idea of it just struck me as kind of interesting it could be uh, it could be fun to write unless somebody already has i wouldn't be surprised if they well, have somebody has written everything but you haven't that is true i haven't written that same story myself maybe i should but yeah it is an interesting concept that whole thing and you know i've i've heard some people talk about that and just be like Pfft. You know, they say, yeah, some you upload your brain, a copy of your brain, and then they can just download you. And you could be, you could even live in the computer. You're like, you're a program that moves around in the computer doing its thing and learning and doing whatever. And then every now and then you upload yourself to a body. Uh, I want to say that's what Cory Doctorow's story called I, Robot was uh, about, where people every now and then would go on tourist jaunts. They would go and see what it was, you know, experience what it was like to be, to have a body. And so, you know, there was, the the story has a a robotic rowboat that would take people out to go scuba diving or snorkeling or whatever at the Great Barrier Reef. And, you know, every now and then somebody would just beam down into these bodies that they had just standing by and you know it was it was like renting scuba gear or something except for you rented the scuba gear and the body to swim in it and they would just stick your brain your upload your consciousness into the brain for a while and then you would download it back out but yeah i don't know that's just a it's a weird thing to think about would that still be you would i i suppose you would think that you were still you even though like when desar is that what it was okay when desar gets killed and then gets re-uploaded or gets a new body or whatever, she doesn't have the memories from the when they were on the atoll because, you know, those were destroyed in the body that they went with, you know, when that thing was killed. Well, and isn't that the, the only, like, justice in the whole story? <laughs> right. Is that they don't know what happened they don't have the details they've lost what is it a week or weeks of precious life and experience that they'll never get again and only he knows what happened it's like the only power that the guy ever gets is there at the end 
But yeah, I mean, they they don't have those memories. They know that there was something more that happened to him, but they don't know, you know, what it was. And are you you at that point? <laughs> you, said, you think, okay, no, I can't be me because me did these other things. And now I'm back, but I didn't do those things. Or I don't have, I have no memory of doing those things. Or is it just the same thing as say, I don't know, you get in a car crash or something and then you wake up in the hospital and you don't even remember having gotten in the car crash because your software was damaged. Your wetware, your, would your brain count as your hardware? I suppose it would count as your hardware, right? I don't know. Let's call it software. <laughs> it's damaged to the point where it doesn't remember that stuff. Uh, I mean, that happens relatively frequently. Then are you still you? You did things that you don't remember. Well, but then a night of binge drinking, you're not you. Yeah, there's that too. You burned out your your uh, <laughs> your neurons that once had that stuff stored. Or you burned out the capacity for your neurons to store things. Or I guess if that's the other thing too, if you get Alzheimer's or something and now you your body is still the same body, but do you remember stuff that you used to do? Are you the same you? If you can't remember your life, if you have none of the experiences that are there behind you, even though the body hasn't changed. In this case, it's the opposite, you know, where you, the brain gets killed and then they put it right back into a body. Now, in this case, the body lives on, but the brain isn't quite right. Is it the same person or is it somebody totally different? Well, I think, and, and you know, I hope this isn't too insensitive, but I think to the family members, on certain days, you are you. And then other days, you're a stranger, you know, with Alzheimer's. Yeah. I, I got to have Big Anklevich back for, you know, today, but I don't know who will be here tomorrow. Yeah, I have heard people say that. And that is terrible, I guess, but it's no different than when you used to work nights and you'd come home and you're, you'd have a conversation with your wife. And the next day, <laughs> she didn't know you'd had this conversation. And that was endlessly fascinating to me. I love <laughs> to hear you tell me these stories where she'd be like, OK, well, let's talk about this. And you're like, can we talk about it tomorrow? Because you won't remember if we talk about it right now. And she's like, no, it's really important. And the next day, she's like, you know, we need to talk about this thing because it's really important. And you're like, dude, I went without sleep. We talked until two in the morning about this. You don't remember any of it? And I always wanted you to record her doing that and then just play it back. Because that would be fascinating for her to be like, this sounds like me. But I, I don't remember saying, I don't think this is me. You know, that kind of, how would that be? I don't know. That's, that's, that's a super unique thing. I guess there have been times when I've had a fever or there have been times when I'm sort of awake, sort of asleep. Like when my mom would wake me up, you know, before school or something like that. And I would say things to her and then afterward be like, gosh, what did I say? So I sort of can experience that. But your wife would have like full on discussions with you and then they'd be <laughs> gone from her mind. And that to me seems unusual. Yeah. So I guess there's a lot of examples of something like that kind of. Yeah. Are you you if you can't remember things? And how much do you really remember from when you were younger and stuff like that? Like the memories... They're not always there at the very least. You know, sometimes a memory will pop out at you all of a sudden. You're like, oh, yeah, I'd forgotten that I used to do this when I was a kid or something. I remember that now. I, I Not until I heard this sound, it triggered the memory in my brain, and now I remember it. Is that the same? You know, they say that I think your body is completely reconstructed every seven years, you know, your body will steadily, you know, replace all of it, recycle so. cells. Yeah. It replaces itself with new self completely by the time seven years has passed. So within seven years, you've got a completely new body. And so are you, you, <laughs> the you that was born, uh, I was born in 1974 I'm not good with math, but I believe that means I've had six complete rebuilds. 
since I was born. And so the me that experienced those things doesn't exist anymore. It's completely gone. I do, I guess, remember a lot of stuff still from that time. I wonder how that works. I guess your memories are somehow rebuilt in the new brain cells that are rebuilt. But have you ever heard somebody say that you only remember something once and then every time after that you are remembering the memory of it and then you're remembering the memory of the memory of it. Have you heard somebody say that before? And that's why like eyewitness testimony and all that is not trustworthy. Right. It's because if you go through somebody's testimony eight times, they don't remember what they saw. They remember the seven times before that you, that you went over the story. So, yeah, I think I have heard that before. And, you know, it kind of makes sense to me, too, because I, you know, there are a lot of things my kids specifically remember from when they were younger. But I know that they don't actually remember it. They remember having seen the video that I recorded of it and then showed them later. And they're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. But they actually just remember seeing the video of it. And now that's a memory that they will actually keep because I recorded it. I remember, I think it was Jim Gaffigan once who was doing a comedy routine where he was talking about, you know, going somewhere, uh, I don't know, we'll say he went to the Roman Colosseum and all these people were there, you know, with their phones in front of their faces, taking pictures and taking videos and all this stuff. And he's just like, geez, people, can't you put your phones down for one second and actually experience the place that you're at? Taking pictures of your kids here, your kids are they're they're gonna be with you later. But this is a place that you're not experiencing because you're taking pictures of it or something. But I remember thinking at the time, but yeah, your kids aren't gonna be the same later. Yeah, I, I, I don't to... know that I could disagree more with Jim Gaffigan. <laughs> it's not the same as when you go to a concert and the band is playing a song and everybody gets their phone out. <laughs> Taking a picture of your kids in front of the Roman Colosseum is more important than looking at the Roman Colosseum. Yeah. Uh, because, A, your kids are more important than the Roman Colosseum. <laughs> and then, two, they will change. They will forget. One will move away and hate you. One will die. And this is a permanent reminder that you were there at this one moment in time that is forever lost. And I'll tell you what, the Roman Colosseum is still going to be there in a hundred years after we're dead. Can I can understand some of it, you know, like, yeah, you know, you know, if you're taking, we'll say, taking a picture of your kids in front of the Roman Colosseum is super worthwhile. Just taking a picture of nobody, just another picture of the Roman Colosseum, Maybe not quite as important because, you know, there's a bajillion pictures of the Roman Colosseum. You could go online and scroll through them and there's going to be people who are way better photographers than you <laughs> that took way better looking pictures. And yeah, I mean, you want to have one or two, but my dad had a tendency like when we would go places. Oh, gosh, the guy photographed the place from every angle. He got, you know just an entire roll of film that he spent on the Grand Canyon. And it's just like, yeah, that's cool, but the Grand Canyon's still there. Lots of people have taken lots of pictures, but you didn't take any pictures of us in front of the Grand Canyon. Where are the pictures of us? So we could say, hey, look, this is me at the Grand Canyon. I went there. I'm, I was four years old, so I don't remember it, but I was there. And this is what I looked like when I was four. He did take, you know, pictures of us at home and stuff. So we, we, you know, we know what we looked like and stuff. But yeah, I was going to go back to something that we said before, but I've lost the track of where we came from. <laughs> well, was it something to do with, is it you? Is it, you know, if you die and come back? Yeah, I think it had something something to do with that, but I, I've, I've forgotten it all now. I guess the brain cells that had those thoughts have since died and been replaced with new brain cells that don't remember remembering that. So I guess we'll just move on. Here's a question for you as far as this concept goes. 
Do you think that we will ever get to a level like this where that can be done, where people's brains can be completely scanned, saved, backed up, and then pumped back out into a new body when someone dies? Do you think that's a possible level of technology? It's totally science fiction at this point in 2020, because we, we, we still don't even understand the human mind. Right. But you and I just the other day were talking about, you know, the computer that you had in college. And you were so <laughs> proud that it had, I think, 500 meg of memory. <laughs> and now your kids, even the little one makes a jerking off motion for anything <laughs> under a terabyte. And in just that short of a time, and for them, it's not been a short time, but in reality, it's been a blink since we were in college. Right. It's been a shortened summer vacation because somebody got the chicken pox since we were in college. And technology has advanced that much. If it continues to advance that fast, then I guess, you know, by the time we're checking out, you know, every single device will have a quadrabyte on it and that's just standard or whatever and you can fill up a whatever a kintabyte you know in a year you're making all these up right <laughs> I, well i just figured you know saying making up these these terms but the, the, the idea that we could map a a human mind i mean i don't know how you could go about it unless there's some way of scanning the brain and transferring that to data but, well, you know what? I don't know how anything works. I don't know how records worked to put music into grooves. I, I still don't. I mean, you know, that's a century old technology and I don't understand how it worked. And so maybe. Yeah, that's true. I don't have to understand it. But it's just you, you see the movies all the time. You know, when we were kids, Optimus Prime transferred his entire consciousness onto a floppy disk. <laughs> and there was a movie a couple of years ago called Transcendence where Johnny Depp uploaded himself into the internet and it was, you know, a sentient living continuation of Johnny Depp after his body died. It's not a good movie, but it's such an interesting idea of that. And I guess maybe we've always been obsessed with immortality and, and how can you continue on after but I am enough of a traditionalist that I wouldn't want to live to see that. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just, that's ghoulish to me. The, what the characters do in this, in this story is morally wrong to me. I mean, granted, she tries to murder him for ratings. And so, of course, these are not heroic characters. But still, it just, the idea of, you know, they'll just live forever and they'll just, they're looking for the new high, the new thrill, you know, whatever right. is, is and, and if it kills them, that's fine because they got a thousand resets and there's something so soulless about that. Yeah. Some kind of irreverence for life, for the gift of life, for the, and, and I, you've heard this said. We've both gone to our parents' funerals and people say, what makes life valuable and precious is that it ends. Yeah, that is an interesting thing. I was talking about that kind of idea with a guy that I work with who's, I think he's in his 60s. And uh, I mean, he's never told me his age, but usually people stop telling you that at a certain age. <laughs> but we were talking about it and he was just like oh uploading your you know I, I wouldn't want to do that no that's i would when it gets time to end you know life just needs to end i don't i don't want to be i don't want to live forever like if you could just keep coming back again and again how bored would you get like how long could you keep doing that before you're just like okay no no i'm done just end it for real wow see dude that is such a surprising attitude for somebody that's nearing the end because yeah, I, all the stuff I just said, notwithstanding, I don't want to die. <laughs> I don't want it to run out because I haven't done anything. Right. I haven't experienced anything. I haven't gone anywhere. 
I haven't been anyone. Uh, but maybe your 60-year-old boyfriend, sorry, co-worker <laughs> has lived and, and experienced a life and held a child in his arms and watched it grow up and go off and have children of its own and, and all that. And maybe once you've been there, done that, you're like, okay, I've had a good run. Yeah. And I'm the same way. I'm I'm too young to die. <laughs> But yeah, will there come a time and maybe there's a difference to it too, you know, like as you get older, your body starts getting, you know, creakier and more broken and and at a certain point, you're just like, oh yeah, please, no, it's time for it to end. But maybe they would change their mind if you suddenly said, no, 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 it's okay, we're going to... uh we're going to resurrect you in your teenage body and, and you're going to start over again. And then they'd be like, oh, OK, no, I'll hang around. Let's let's try this again. That'll be fun. That was something that happened in the Cory Doctorow story. Uh, not the one that I was talking about, iRobot, but uh, another one where basically this stuff was going on. And way in the future, uh, at a certain point, people didn't have kids anymore and kind of became a thing where you you couldn't have kids because if you kept having kids and nobody ever died then you know there's no place for people to go anymore you would all be standing shoulder to shoulder so they had to stop having kids and uh, he even had a, a companion short story to that book where p- people that were a part of the last generation mm. talking you know and, and what they thought was interesting and stuff like that and yeah that's a that's a interesting thing that goes along with that if everybody is able to continue on forever then what happens there but i don't know you know i used to think that something like this would never come to pass because you know like you said we we still just have no idea really how the mind works how it connects what it does what one thing does to the other we're like oh, this this region here lights up when people have an orgasm or whatever, you know, they, they, they've they done brain scans or whatever, and they see activity when certain things happen. And so they're like, oh, this region of the brain is what does this, and this region is what does that. But they don't really know. It's all kind of guesses in the dark, really. And it makes me think that there's no way that we could ever get to this level But I used to think also that, you know, just like the robot hand that Luke Skywalker gets, you know, it looks like a real hand. He just puts the little control panel thing. He closes the control panel up and now you don't know that it's not a real hand and it moves and all that stuff all the same. And presumably it's somehow connected to his brain so that when his brain thinks grab something, it does. You know, I was thinking, yeah, that's something that we're never going to get to. We don't understand how the brain works. So how are we going to make something respond to brain waves? But they're already starting to do that. I've seen things where they're coming up with bionic arms and legs and things like that that actually respond to brain waves. I don't know how rudimentary it is and how well they work. And I think there is like a lag. So, you know, you have to think, walk and then, you know, it takes a long time learning how to do it because the thing responds slowly. <laughs> to, you know, it doesn't respond as well as your actual flesh and blood did when you still had it. But yeah, it makes me think that maybe despite being a traditionalist, we might live to see this happen. I don't know. It's hard to say because, yeah, things like you said, you know, that, that stupid little computer that I had when I was uh, younger that you know, blew my mind. It had such a huge hard drive on it. And now, yeah, I, I can put a hard drive that size in my pocket and attach it to my keychain. Nanotech, too, which is what is going on in this story. We've got the, the nano cloud that they released to try and clean up the environment. And unfortunately, it cleaned up the environment until it was so pure that everything was dead. How long until nanotech starts doing the things that we see in science fiction books. Well, they had living kayaks that farted and played. (laughs) And that's something I wanted to talk to Jason about. It's like, what? (laughs) The sandstorm with a mind of its own, I could get my head around. 
<laughs> but just the living <laughs> kayaks. It's like, but why would we have that? I, what, I, I don't I, know. I guess uh, aside from the farting, uh, it's probably greener than a, uh, well, shoot, no, a kayak. I suppose a kayak has to be made out of some kind of plastic or something. So, you know, it's not going to be as green as a living kayak. <laughs> But it keeps farting, and, and yeah, are cow farts supposed to be what is destroying the world now? So I'm sure kayak farts are going to be just as bad. <laughs> Jason is a real writer. I guess I should have said this before. Like, every once in a while I will write a story and it will have, like, a clever line of dialogue in it, or will have a idea that is, oh, hey, that's a good idea that I've based this story around. And every single thing that I read that he's written has multiple good ideas and interesting concepts. And I just am very envious of his ability and that just the, the, the worlds that he has created are not just our world with, you know, talking dogs in them. <laughs> it's an entire visualized alternate universe future. Yeah, that's just amazing to me. I, and, and I am grateful that he continues to share these stories with us so that we can share them with you well thank you jason yeah it always blows me away because he does all this stuff for a short story it seems like so much effort to put into a short story when it's a novel's worth of effort that gets put into his short stories um it just it always blows my mind every time I read his stories. I feel like I'm not worthy to be reading these or something. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he really is a real writer, and he does so much with his stuff that uh, yeah, it it blows me away for sure. And everyone is new and completely different. You know, the last one that we did, uh, we eat the hearts that come for you, was. A completely alien world to this alien world, which is a completely alien world to the world that we live in now. And, you know, every time his stories are that way, it's always something that's just so alien and different and uh, just amazing that uh, each one of his stories is a treat. Well, I hope the listeners felt the same way. It's cool. And I hope that they enjoyed our little conversation afterward. You and I do still talk quite a bit on the phone, but we don't podcast nearly as much as we used to together. But uh, yeah, I feel like this was a fun discussion. And uh, there are a bunch of topics that we could talk about. Uh, if we all end up in quarantine, maybe there will be a lot more. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I was thinking that, and I don't know if we want to talk about this on the show or not, but I, I was considering that we need to get a patreon going for the dune steve where uh we could promise everybody we'd do an episode a month would be our uh you know our goal i'd like to do that with the show seems like that would be doable but i i figured it would probably be a good motivating factor if we did the patreon and had it be a you know you only get paid when the episode comes out kind of a thing like you do with the rich outcast see if we could uh Get something going with that so that we could have more episodes because it seems like we could manage an episode a month, <laughs> but making it the priority, the number one thing, I don't know. Should we talk about that on the show or should we leave that off? <laughs> <laughs> I, I Sorry, I, I considered just putting it as an outtake at the end because you started it with, I don't know if we want to talk about this, but... I, I don't feel like we should cut it out because somebody somewhere would be like, I'd totally support a Patreon, a Dune Steve Patreon. Well, if anybody is listening, I don't know. <laughs> right. So I'm curious to know, Would would is it a bad time? I mean, there is that. I know that we are in bad economic times suddenly they they have suddenly come upon us where you know things were were going it was the roaring 20s just a minute ago and now all of a sudden it's the great depression and 
I don't know if it's going to come back or not, or and I don't know how much it's affecting everybody or not. I uh, and I guess it's hard to say if we can know. Maybe this isn't the right time to start something like that. Maybe it never will be the right time to start something like that. But well, but at the same time, the subscriptions to Disney Plus tripled once this thing happened. People want entertainment. They want escapism, especially if they're stuck at home. That is true. I mean, I, I don't know. There, it, it's conceivable that there are people that are happy that we are podcasting because it takes their mind. <laughs> are you sure that's conceivable? <laughs> I know that that's, that's crazy. But, but in February, I went through like a really difficult time where I was vacillating between very high and super, super miserable every single day. And this show, Star Trek Picard, came out and I watched the first episode with my cousin and for an hour, for a single hour, I didn't think any of those thoughts. I wasn't unhappy. It took me away. And so if, if somebody had come to me afterward and said, yeah, I'm sorry, that'll be 50 bucks. I would have given them 50 bucks for that hour of just escape. And, and I'm not comparing me to uh, Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the Starship Enterprise. Just th- th- there are people that need entertainment or need... What's the word where it's just like, hey, take a break from what you're thinking about? Uh, release? A uh, catharsis? I don't know. A... So I'm just saying, you know, that maybe for some people, not for everybody, of course, but for some people, us having a new Dune Steve show up in their inbox will be exactly what they want or exactly what they need right now. Yeah, okay. Yes, there are people listening that are just like, yeah, podcasting is the last thing that I, I need to focus on right now. But then there are other people that are like, no, no, sign me up. If you guys could do more than an episode a month, that's worth it. Okay, well... I, I just I think of Tom when all hell broke loose. Was it in New York? Oh, right, yeah. Hurricane Sandy, I think it was. And he was very kind in letting us know that he, that our show had taken his mind off of what was going on. and He rode his bicycle around and he listened to the show, and that moved me a lot. It made me feel like I had done something good, when really it was just me and you getting together, as we always did. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I imagine that there are other Toms out there, or maybe oh. even Tom is out there. I don't know. <laughs> I bet he is. And there are other Toms out there, too. I've, I've known a few other Toms through the years. There's... I sat next to Tom Selleck one time at a screening. Oh, wow. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, Tom Selleck. <laughs> I'm going to grow a mustache. <laughs> but yeah, okay. So I guess if you would be interested in that, you know, and we would obviously with Patreon, you don't have to give much. It's a you can be just a dollar, I think, per uh, whatever episode or whatever. Let us know. I guess in the comments of whatever you see this post on, uh, in the comments on Facebook or in the comments on, I know nobody goes to the forum to the forum anymore. That's pretty much dead. I don't know if I even go there to post the the episode things anymore. But yeah, if you see it in the comments of of Facebook or you could tweet back at us because I, I do tweet out every episode. They can just comment on the dunesteef.com too, on the episode. They could. We'll still see those. So, yeah, you could comment there, too. Uh, let us know if, if you would be interested in us doing that. Because I am curious to know. I, I, I've been really considering doing it. and I. But, yeah, when this all started going down, I thought, oh, I better not do that. Probably, it's probably not the right time for that. Maybe I just better put that off until when it is the right time. And then I thought, will it ever be the right time again? Oh, crap. It's hard to know. Maybe I should never mention it. (laughs) The right time was the first time you heard about Patreon. I know. Yeah, sadly, 2000, what, 13 or whenever the heck that was that somebody said, why don't you guys try Patreon? And we said, what's that? I'm not going to look and find out. I'm just going to go I just assumed it was like Kickstarter or something (laughs) like that. I just, yeah, it's too bad. Yeah. (sighs) Anyways, let us know. I think we've, uh, we've said enough. (laughs) You've said enough. Before we finish up, though, I just wanted to let you know that after a terabyte is a petabyte... Oh, yum. 
petabyte. It's actually a PETA, like with an E, though. PETA, like like the people oh. for the ethical treatment of animals. That's too bad. <laughs> so in the, it's not yummy. It's you're you're eating uh, vegan stuff <laughs> with your bite. <laughs> and then after that is an exabyte. Ooh, exabyte. I like that. Too. Then a zetabyte. And then a Yoda by a Yota or Yata. It's with two T's. Y O T T A. So yeah, those are the next ones. And I, I wonder if we'll live long enough to see a Yata bite, Yoda bite. We'll call it Yoda. It's more fun. I don't know how you pronounce them, but I just thought I, since I looked that up, I had to had to say it before I uh, finished off. <laughs> Yeah, and now I have to find the the more you know sound effect. Dang it. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. I have been Big Anklevich. And I have been Rish Outfield. And watch out, Yoda bites. <laughs> Yoda bites. Yoda bleeds. <laughs> it's what I need. <laughs> The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine.